Hi, this is Sri Paravamba for SID. I'm the chair of marketing and uh, I'm uh, very happy, very pleased to, to moderate the CEO forum for SID Display Week 2020. We've been doing this for three years. Uh, prior to that, this session was uh, called the CMO forum and the CEO forum allows us to uh, bring in leaders in the industry that can talk about their experiences, um, tell you about what we think is going to happen in the near term future that you can benefit from, as well as um, uh, the theme for this year is uh, success leaves clues. And each of the panelists are very successful in their career and uh, they have left some clues as to how they were successful. And uh, the hope is to uh, dig this out and uh, for everybody to learn. So that is the uh, introduction to the session. Uh, I've been in the display industry for a long time. Uh, this is my volunteer gig uh, supporting SID uh, to do this forum and a bunch of other uh, SID related matters. SID, as you know, is uh, a global organization uh, supporting the electronic display industry. This year, because of the pandemic, we are doing everything virtual. But that said, the knowledge and the information and the panel discussion will be just as effective as if you are uh, physical. With that, um, let me introduce the panelists. We've got a wonderful uh, set of panelists this year. Dr. Oman Lastman is uh, Vice President and the Head of Performance uh, Materials Fund uh, called M Ventures, which is part of Merck KGAA out of Darmstadt. Um, he is um, uh, in his day job, he invests in companies. So he looks at a number of companies in our space. He coaches many of these companies. He has board roles. Uh, previously, he was in R&D. His expertise is in liquid crystal, uh, as you can imagine, uh, as well as uh, in uh, inkjet printing. And his uh, the, uh, inventions he's had and the work he's done have gone into a number of products other than displays into organic solar cells, uh, transistors, sensors, and so on. With that, uh, welcome, Owen. Thank you, Shree. Well, nice to see you. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, there's not much to add to that introduction. Um, it was uh, very thorough and it made me sound much more important than I really am. So thank you for that. Um, I'm really a scientist at heart and, and I love seeing the technologies um, developed and brought to market. So this for me is, is the perfect job because I get to be at the, the cutting edge of where that really happens. Um, so it's a, it's a great time to be uh, in this industry as well. A lot of great innovations uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Annie Rogaski is uh, Chief Operating Officer for Avigant Corporation. Um, she's got a background in chemistry and law, and uh, she's an entrepreneur at heart. She's done a number of different things from operations to finance to sales and marketing. And uh, she works for a startup company in the AR VR space, working on light field uh, displays, which is, uh, as everybody knows, is a hot field here. Um, she also uh, runs a couple of different podcasts, one of them being Unraveling Pink, where she brings men and women to talk about uh, gender bias in the industry. And uh, her um, team for many of the companies she works with, as well as for uh, uh, the, the company where she's the chief operating officer, is this concept of team joy uh, as, a, uh, as a core cultural value uh, within the company. With that, uh, Annie, welcome. Thank you, Shri. I, I could not have said it better. I, I appreciate that. You captured my background quite well. Um, as you noted, I believe in a couple of things that we should solve for joy and that getting to know each other as unique human beings is critical to our future. Um, as you mentioned, I had a very kind of unusual and winding path in my uh, way to Avagant as COO. And now I have the amazing privilege of, of supporting a team that is developing display optics of the space. And we hope to deliver previously impossible consumer augmented reality experiences. So I'm excited to be here. I look forward to the conversation and appreciate you putting this together. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Scott Song is uh, the uh, third panelist on our team. Scott uh, has got about 20 years of experience working mostly in the electronic display industry. Uh, he's the uh, CEO of Pervasive Displays, which is part of the BOE group, which is one of the largest uh, display companies in our industry. He started with the Chime Corporation in, um, out of uh, Tainan, 
And within the corporation, he has built a number of startups and uh, he's taken a few of them to exit. I believe he has built about nine different companies. And um, he is also part of the SES uh, uh, company out of Paris. And um, Scott uh, today advises startup companies. He invests in startup companies. And of course, he's got uh, the job of uh, running pervasive uh, displays out of uh, BOE. With that, uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you so much, Sri. Uh, you make me sound much more important than I really am. Um, it's really a, a privilege to be sitting on the panel with uh, such accomplished people, and I hope I can contribute today. Thank you. No, you certainly can. And uh, uh, the, uh, the wonderful thing about our industry is it's constantly changing. There are new technologies constantly happening, and um, some of the existing technologies keep getting better and better. Um, and what I like the most about our entire industry is not just these established technologies and companies and doing all these wonderful things, but also these startups um, that are constantly inventing something new. And when we think we've invented everything possible in a certain technology, there's something new. And that's what makes it very exciting. So with that, let's start with the, the first question I have is, so, uh, what are the traits of a successful startup? What are the signs that you look for when you look at a startup and say, hey, you know, I see the startup as having the potential. Uh, let me take that question and give it to you, Owen. Uh, you look at a lot of uh, different startups uh, in your uh, day job. Uh, what are the traits of a successful startup? Yeah, I mean, it's not an easy question to answer, actually. Um, it, it might sound quite easy and you can make a very nice checklist um, and it will never give you a good startup. Um, so. I mean, when, when we're looking for things, primarily as a corporate investor, you know, the first thing we look at is, is, um, is the topic, uh, is the company able to deliver some strategic value that, that Merck, um, uh, KJ, Darmstadt can, can offer uh, to some support. So we're, when we engage in an, an investment, you know, we're looking at companies that we um, can form a relationship with and that we can bring value to as, as much as uh, support them on their journey. Um, but, you know, the, the key things that we're looking for are usually it's team, it's culture, it's a great technology, it's a really under, it's an understanding of the market. Um, you know, all of the kind of the hard things, IP, uh, very important. But um, and I think Annie will probably elaborate on this. You know, for us, one of the important things is the culture of the team and, and how how the management and the, the technical team and the board, um, you know, these these things which you can't really assess. Uh, numerically, but are very important to the success of a, of a company longer term. Um, you can, you can. Um, it's necessary, but uh, insufficient to have a good technology. Um, I, I would say. What do you think, Annie? I agree with Owen. I think uh, you know what you're talking about, Owen, are things that I don't know how, from an investment standpoint, you you tease that out. Um, I know from being in the culture and experiencing what it's like to be on a team that really is is humble and uh, prioritizes helping each other and um, you know it says I've made a mistake and everyone just wants to help fix it, not assign blame. Like those things are so uh, intangible and yet so critical to a team working really well together. Um, but I agree that having you know, clarity around where you're going, especially in these days when things are more challenging. Um, having a team that works really well together and is is trying to advance things and not out for themselves and transparency between management and the team, like really feeling like you're in it together, that you have the information you need to be successful. Um, all of those pieces are really, really critical. Yeah. Very good. Well, big difference between when when you're in, within a company and you're looking at the company from outside, isn't it? Yeah. Um, at, the, at the end, we're, I mean, at the end, I always see an investment as uh, we're paying an entry fee to join the party late, right? Um, so um, it, it's kind of for me, you know, we're 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 becoming part of that team almost, and uh, you know that that's part of the assessment that we do. Is this a team we want to be part of? Um, and you know, using the teams that use their investors. To their uh, benefit, also can 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 help themselves a lot, right? So um, it's not just the cash that we bring; it, it's it's that um, additional benefit as well. So yeah, yeah. for both parties, for sure. Scott, you invest in companies. Um, what are you yeah. looking? For? Yeah, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you know, in building the company, one of the the most important things I think is is having leadership throughout the entire company. 
not just at the top, but every single person that comes in uh, feels like they are, are leading the company in some way, taking them to a direction that they want. Um, so visionary, when people talk about visionary, typically it's one person, but I, I believe it needs to be a team. And that same visionary team needs to be very disciplined as well. So being able to, to uh, you know, run fast and, and run very far, right? Two very diff different disciplines, but we need to have that in one, one team. The other uh, really important topic, I think, is, is that uh, the people need to be committed to each other. Um, it's success, right? So um, I work for my team members. My my team members work, work for me, and we're we're there to to really really support each other to do something that's important. And when we see a team, you know, may it be as starting a company or investing, when I see a team that's really committed to each other, and you can see that in the meetings uh, when you sit down and, and listen to the pitch, and you you, you can feel it. Uh, it really is a, a key ingredient for success. No, thank you. That, that, uh, the, the, of, the, there are these tangible things and there are these intangible things and sometimes those intangible things are what makes those uh, companies very valuable. Um, so it, let's talk in terms of um, startup companies that have done some really great things um, and any of you can take this question as to have you seen examples of startup companies? You don't necessarily need to name them. You could if you wanted to that have done some really extraordinary things and they could be an example for other startups to follow uh, are there some very unique things that startup companies have done that you have observed that either you have invested because they've done something uh, very unique or you admire them because you know of them and you've seen them skyrocket i mean many of the companies that today are, are uh, have a trillion dollar valuation were startups not that long ago right and uh, uh, and I'm sure there are companies in our space today that are little companies that are coming to, uh, to you asking for funding or asking for coaching or seeking your advice and including many people who are going to be in the audience listening to you, this particular panel will become part of that, um, uh, you know, that growth cycle and they will become very large companies. And um, so they may be able to learn from some of your um, uh, uh, examples. Well, one that jumps out for me um, in a very different space, but was Airbnb, uh, just in how they started uh, building a community from scratch. You know, they had this idea that was it had never been seen before, and it, it's so personal as you, you bring people into your home. Um, it, the way that that the leadership team got in there in in building that community and strengthening and really being visible, not just to the team, but to the community. I thought was, was a very strong example of a startup that's building community, um, which is a little bit different than building hardware. Um, but that's one, one startup that I thought was interesting in how they approached it. Well, thank you. That's a company that I admire as well. Um, Scott? You know, from, from, a, from a Taiwan perspective, you know, I've spent the last uh, 15 years in Taiwan looking at uh, startups from a different perspective. And, you know, one part of uh, getting funding is is obviously going to the VCs and, and talking. The other side in the display side, in, in the display world is actually scaling and manufacturing. And I, I see that also as part of kind of very important part of growing a, a startup and, and taking it different places. And, and so being aware of how the technology fits within manufacturing, within timing, and it's not only uh, can the, process and technology fit within the manufacturing process, but also understanding that there's a chicken and egg in all manufacturing and to scale, you need to get the timing right, you need to get the technology right, and then you need to understand your uh, position in the value chain. And that sometimes is really hard when you're just pitching one, you know, you're coming in and saying, I've got this killer technology that really works, but you don't think about the larger scope. And so I think having those things in mind and putting into context, for the investors and or the manufacturers really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, Scott. And uh, I mean, I think um, yeah, display technology uh, is not something that you do, you you take on uh, lightly, right? I mean, it, there's a certain um, a certain tenacity needed to to bring any display technology to the market. Um, and it, you, you really need to have a, a strong belief in the company. You need to see that belief. Um, and it's, it's when people come with a crazy idea um, to solve a problem um, that, that you really see that coming to bear. You know, so if you know a great physics concept that's, that's uh, you know, the whole team are behind, 
Um, you can, if you can bake that into a technology and scale it, um, then that's that's the recipe for success, basically. Uh, but that's not easy. It takes it takes a lot of uh, a lot of belief in yourself to go through um, that journey. Um, there's a lot of hurdles in the way, um, and it's a very long and complicated value chain as well, as we all know. Right? There's uh, to to go from one to many is not is not trivial, um, as Scott as Scott mentioned. And uh, having that in mind from the big from the beginning, but having it not constrain your vision to the point where you don't invent the best thing you can invent is 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 is, is an art, I think. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. And um, I had the good fortune of working for a fairly large company that had extraordinary talent, extraordinary technology, billions of dollars in revenue, and uh, and then uh, I had the opportunity to go from there to a little startup that uh, uh, the technology was still emerging. Um, but uh, the little startup became quite successful, whereas the established company I was working with started struggling. And to me, it was all about uh, recruiting the right talent and bringing a, a, a team that uh, really made a difference. So along those lines, my next question to um, each of you are, how do you find great talent? Okay. And then within that context, um, uh, you know, how do you uh, find diversity in that talent? How do you go hire minorities when that pool, a candidate pool, is fairly small? Um, so, Annie, why don't we start with you uh, in terms of how do you find great talent? How do you hire minorities? Uh, what are some things you do in the area of HR? Yeah, so um, it's it's challenging. Um, we we are in a space. My company, uh, in particular, which is you know the experience I draw from, is in a very narrow space, and we haven't done a whole lot of hiring in the last few years. But the one position we were hiring for was was even more specialized than um, our general uh, talent pool, and so um, it was really hard to find anybody who had the right right criteria. Um, what I found was that. Uh, there, there are a couple things. There's internal uh, culture issues, and then there's how do you how do you actually go out and find the people that you need within the company? Your mindset matters. Like, do you value uh, diversity? Do you do you see it not as a check box or a box to check, but as something that actually makes you better and makes your products better because you're thinking about issues that you might not otherwise think about. You're bringing different perspectives and broader perspectives and deeper perspectives to the problem. Um, and so having that mindset within the company and having that buy-in within the company um, is important because if you do have the, the uh, success of bringing in somebody who is in an underrepresented group, if they get there and they're the first one and they have a culture that doesn't embrace them, doesn't make them feel like they belong, then they're not going to stay. And so uh, you have to start somewhere. And a lot of times you're the only, you're the only woman, or you're the only person of color, you're the only black person in that company. And that's a really hard position to be in. Um, but if you're going from zero to something, you might have to transition through that one person as the mm -hmm. first. And when you do that, having a culture that's welcoming, that's belonging, that acknowledges um, the value that we all bring is really important to make that stick. It's like in gardening, you know, you amend the soil, you make it as good as possible. So when you plant those seeds, they actually grow. But then externally, looking for talent, I really think that so much of our hiring happens through our networks. And if we look at our networks, do they look like us? You know, if you have a, a founding team of, of three white men and their networks are large 90% white men, you know that your company is going to grow as largely white men. Um, and so diversifying your network, getting to know people who, who don't look like you, um, I think is really important. And then also we often hear, you know, I don't want to sacrifice quality, which sends a very negative message about underrepresented groups. When really, if someone has made it to that level, as an underrepresented group, they've overcome obstacles and hurdles that that the majority group didn't have to overcome. And so they come out the other side, not only with at least the same level of skill, probably better because they have to be better to get through, 
but they also have developed things like resilience and grit, which are really important and are kind of like these plus values when you're looking for, for talent. So I think shifting a mindset around how do we look at the hires that we make and the people and see the value they bring separate from what school they went to um, or what their grades were, for example. Um, thank you. I, I mean, you highlighted something very important, particularly I can take your example into SID as an organization we are run by volunteers. Uh, vast majority of us uh, are men and not just men, we, we are um, an intimidating group of men because most of us have <laughs> decades of experience that we don't really have a lot of people with five or ten years experience and it's been a challenge. In the Silicon Valley chapter for uh, SID, we've solved this. 50% of our officers are women, and it wasn't easy. But now, because of the diversity, we are getting new ideas, new thoughts, and everything. And, I, I, and the future is going to be much better because we took that initiative. What's also nice about uh, all of us are we kind of grew up in different parts of the world. And with that, we have some additional background and uh, experience that is unique. Uh, Owen, what are your experiences uh, in terms of hiring? Yeah, well, I mean, I have a very small team at the moment, um, but we do a lot of hiring within the companies and previously running large R&D organizations, we had a lot of, um, lot of hiring, but I was, I was kind of a little bit, I mean, I guess I'm kind of blessed in a way that I worked for a big um, global corporate because diversity was kind of inbuilt in effect because we had a lot of rotation from, um, you know, various subsidiaries and things like that. Um, I think Annie kind of highlighted it really. It's it's a lot about the network. Um, and um, I mean, you know, things that we're trying to do internally and also with, um, you know, hopefully this is creating these foundations, uh, as Annie mentioned about, you know, making sure you've got the right the right soil. Um, so, you know, Merck does a lot of training on, on things like uh, unconscious bias. We're very uh, mindful of these things, trying to raise awareness. Um, I think also Annie raised a nice point, which is about quality. Um, and I think that's, you know, I don't think you sacrifice quality. It depends how you define quality. And I think maybe that's the, the, the issue people need to redefine because having diversity in the teams and having different thought can make meetings longer, can mean there's more discussion, but actually you're teasing out things that you wouldn't have normally uh, discussed. And it's, as I say, it's also about diversity of thinking and about the um, experience as well that people bring. Um, so there's a lot of elements to it, but I think, I think the, um, the bias uh, against the, the kind of the, the norm um, extends even within the same demographic. Um, if, if your if your personality type is quite different, there's even there's even you know selection against that. So I mean we have a long way to go to make this um, perfect, but I think the fact that there's awareness building um, helps us uh, to to do better, right? Um, and we need to start to um, I guess raise the um, the importance of it when we're discussing with our portfolio companies and with our teams. Uh, in general, uh, that's the only way we do it by putting priority on it. Yeah, our experience in SID was we were trying to do this at the corporate board level. It wasn't very easy. It was taking too long. Uh, whereas everybody was interested in doing the right thing. So I just went and said, I don't have to ask anybody, at least in the Silicon Valley chapter. We just went and made it. And I had no experience. Yeah. We tried, we made many mistakes, but it finally happened. I think if you have a strong will, and you're willing to make mistakes and just go forward uh, and then it just happens. Scott, uh, you hired people uh, in, in uh, Asia, uh, probably even more than North America or Europe, or maybe you've no. hired a lot. No, 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 it's, um, yeah. Most so most, most of the time, it's, it's, it's been really interesting for us because I, our company is located in south of Taiwan in a city called Tainan. So there's not a lot of diversity to, to speak of, but one of the things that we, uh, pervasive has really really benefit from is is the number of women that we have especially moms um, that we have in in our companies and it, it's it's invaluable to have these very wise patient right um, able people that that look at things very differently from 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 me um, an alpha male right so um, and, and many times they're they're uh, very open to give criticism um, positively and to to do it, you know, and and also the other thing that I I feel very strongly about is because we have moms in in our team, uh, they're, they're they're selfless and they're willing to go out and share it uh, and and make the people team around them better. And uh, so I guess this is a plug for moms, right? For <laughs> Taiwanese moms or moms all around the world, really, um, fantastic source of of amazing talents that 
that really uh, is sometimes underappreciated. So. No, completely agreed. Uh, when I started my own gig a few years ago, I made a promise to myself that I'll spend um, at least five to 10% of my time helping unemployed people find jobs. And I started focusing on people over the age of 55. And you'd think in Silicon Valley, we don't discriminate, we certainly do. And then uh, also focus on these kids fresh out of school without a job. And these two categories have a very, very tough time um you know getting back into employment is never easy uh, let's switch subjects a little bit but continue to stay in the industry uh, uh, what are some trends you're seeing from a technology perspective um, where do you think uh, the money will flow in our industry in the next three years in terms of what types of products technologies and companies you think will receive the funding whether it's public funding whether it's venture funding and that sort of thing um any of you can take this question okay well I'll, I'll i'll have a go to start with i'll kick it off and then everybody can disagree with me um so i mean it's it's interesting times for the industry actually um it's you know for a long time we've been in a situation where there's kind of one dominant technology um now there's quite a lot of different uh, technologies coming forward you know i mean oled is is already kind of now commonplace uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of innovation in the micro display space um, you know, the new use cases like AR, VR, um, 8K, um, you know, foldable, rollable, there's, there's, there's huge amounts of, um, you know, new innovation and new development and new segmentations um, of the market. So I think there's a lot of opportunity um, and certainly a lot of interest in tech coming forward uh, because each of these new technologies has a lot of um, bottlenecks and, you know, things that need to be fixed in order to make these mass, product, uh, mass production ready at, at a cost that people can tolerate. So um, I think it's really interesting. There also seems to be a lot of convergence between uh, both ways, actually, between display and the kind of conventional semiconductor industry. Um, so a lot of the, um, you know, these micro displays are now, the semiconductor fabs are now thinking, can we make these micro displays? Display fabs are thinking, can we make panel level packaging? So can we diversify into you know, electronics packaging. So it's um, it's very interesting. Uh, the technology is driving some very interesting changes, and that will also distribute the redistribute the cash throughout the industry uh, differently over the years as well. Um, it creates a lot of opportunity, um, and I think it creates a lot of new new areas and new niches that we can that, that could be quite large, significant, in fact. Um, and it'd be very interesting to see you know what some of the big platform providers are uh, are planning on the AR VR. Um, when, when that comes forward. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, in the next two, three years, I think we're going to see some very exciting developments, um, especially for more wearable uh, technology. No, completely agreed. But now, Any Andy and Scott can agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. AR is the future. Um, <laughs> Out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is exciting to be in the AR space right now because I think uh, not only is there a lot of exciting progress being made on the display side but for the past three four months we've all been sitting at home and looking at each other on these screens and it could have been so different if we had a fully developed ar headset at this point that people could use and there was content to to use uh and do this virtually in person um so i'm excited about that uh, i also think that um where I sit in the AR space, uh, there's, I see all these different pieces coming in. So uh, displays and hardware, of course, are, are critical to making any of that happen. But we have, um, a, you know, AI and uh, machine learning and facial recognition and eye tracking and all of these things that when they finally come together in AR, um, create a lot of amazing potential, but then also some kind of scary possibilities if, if used um, in ways that are not for good. And so as I look at, at how technology is evolving and where we're headed, I think a couple of things are really important. One that we've already talked about is having those diverse teams who are thinking about those issues. Like in facial recognition, we've seen a lot of companies start pulling back from that. And we saw early in the development of that technology that uh, women and, and black faces were not being recognized. And that's a big problem if you think about a future that involves facial recognition across the board, like you're leaving people out of that future. And so thinking about how uh, diverse inputs 
are creating the foundation for what is feels like a next wave of technology that will be generational for for us to experience um, and then also the responsibility that comes with that like who's thinking about the ethics of how we use this technology we all have our pieces our domains that we're looking at um, but we also have now experienced like the first wave of of the internet community and what can happen on on platforms out there um, and so it's a good time for us to be thinking about how are we going to use these technologies? How do we want to use them? What are the guardrails? Are they built into the product itself? Are they software bound? Are they legislative? Um, so I think there's a lot of both potential and potential to really think about how we want to use technology going forward. Totally agreed. I, I think um, as long as we are mindful and we plan uh, from the very beginning, it's much easier to solve rather than just um, get into some technology with a simple application then to discover all these issues that we had to be much harder to fix later on. Um, Scott, you know, if, if you're going to put plunk in uh, $10 million, uh, which part of the industry uh, excites you the most? Uh, I wish I had $10 million. <laughs> 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 it's not going to own on that. Um, I, I just, you know, I just choose to put my time in things that I think is important and fun. And, and I, I think, you know, the, the one obvious thing that Annie had pointed out, that's obvious is, uh, you know, this unified communication space and what's happening with everybody talking to each other. And I think it's, you know, it's just, it's got to be, to me, it's got to be more than just talking to each other on a screen, right? How do you do things more collaboratively in a meaningful, deep kind of way? Uh, wow, the sun's coming through and, and pointing at me here. And then, um, so, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot to that. There's, uh, so, you know, going beyond just the medium of just talking to each other, right? How do you really, really collaborate in a meaningful way from a distance? I think that's 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 quite meaningful. The other uh, that I've been looking uh, quite a bit in is digital lighting. I think there's uh, the, you know, the, the DLP is coming back <laughs> and there's a lot of applications across different areas. And it's, it's really interesting to see how um, people are reinventing uh, what can be done with the micro display. Um, and 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 I'm I'm excited to to spend more time um, playing that field and see what value we can add. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agreed. I think um, we've discovered that these uh, immersive experiences are pretty tremendous, and uh, there's a lot of interest there to develop that. And I think um, I think it's also just uh, if I just can just elaborate a little bit Shri, on that point. I mean, it's um it's also you know true of any display that uh, the hardware is only the the tip of the iceberg, right? It's the psychology of how the user perceives that display, which is ultimately the most important thing. And I think um, with it, with it AR and VR, that's going to be really an important um, aspect to develop. Um, you know, how do we make use of the the technology to, to provide the right experience and and in a way which is sort of psychophysically acceptable and uh, and, and enjoyable? Yeah, we 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 hate it when uh, the true value in a product is not our display, but it is some software. <laughs> but uh, but that is the truth. Some of these products are just like that. Um, so uh, let's talk about a slightly depressing subject. Uh, we've talked about some really you know uplifting subjects. Which you know life is not just all ups. There are some downs. So the last several months we've been in a shutdown mode worldwide. Right. Our industry has lost revenues. Um, uh, lots of people have been unemployed, maybe not as much in our industry, but the broad in, uh, uh, you know, society as such lost a lot of jobs and therefore people have less money. They're not spending as much money buying displays, investing company, doing all these different things. So what is your advice to companies for the next half of um, this year in terms of what they could be doing to not only recover, but get back on that uh, very positive, proactive way in which they were working before all of the shutdown happened. Um, Annie, you want to take this one? You're sure, in Silicon I, Valley, you know, there is a lot of enthusiasm. We, we, we don't believe in, uh, um, uh, you know, being depressed. It's all about tomorrow. <laughs> Well, it, it has been pretty fascinating to be in the hardware space because we work together, we work with things, and we're a multi-functional team that uh, in regular times works really closely together. And, and we've had to distribute uh, different parts of our lab to people's houses. So 
it's been really challenging to um, uh, not only, you know, I mean, we're pre-revenue, so we're not, it, it's not a sales hit for us so much as a progress hit, um, trying to um, move things fast, as fast as we normally would when you have uh, people in different cities and driving hardware and leaving them on porches or dropping them off at the office and not passing, you know, ships passing in the night. Um, so it's been challenging. We've tried to uh, really conserve cash and be mindful of, of where we're um, cutting costs uh, to save money and to extend the runway. Um, we've also had to have much more discipline in our focus. We have a very creative team who comes up with new ideas all the time, and uh, it's nice to be able to chase some of those. But at this point in time, we have to be more disciplined and think about, okay, what gets us to the next milestone that we can raise on? And so we, it, it's forced us to take a look at not just what we're working on and where our best successes are, but where our customers will want us to be um, mm -hmm. in charting that course. Uh, it, it was very exciting to, to kind of get back into the office. So we've sort of opened up. We did a return to work uh, policy that uh, I got to learn all about uh, multi-layered laws of federal and state and municipal. Um, and healthcare and all these things to try to come up with a way that we could at least get a few people in the office um, to work on hardware together. And that's been amazing to, to actually see the progress um, pick up when that's happened. But, but it's hard. I mean, if, if you need to work together and move things forward, um, sheltering in place in your homes is not the best way to do it. So discipline for us and cost savings have been the, the critical factors. I, I, I would say, you know, for us, it's very, uh, um, I, I learned recently from a friend who told me that you're not in the business of making displays, you're in the business of survival and making money, okay? And and it's it's really meaning, that's a very meaningful statement for me because basically, it, you know, I, we've always been making, you know, at Pervasive, we make millions of displays every single uh, month and it's, but, but, you know, it's, it's not just about what you're doing today, right? It's, it, you're looking out and it's maybe a half a year, a year and a half, however long, you know, whatever your theory is. And you got to figure out how to pivot your company in, in such a way that you, you know, that the people that, you know, you're fighting for is going to be, is going to have a job down the line. And that takes a willingness for you to re-examine what it is you're doing, may, may be successful or not, right? And then figure out a very practical, very disciplined step in, in how you can really get from A to B and survive. Because if you don't survive, nothing, you know, there's, 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 you know, the everything's lost. And so I, you know, it, it maybe it's a little more gloom and doom, but I think it's about focusing on what gets gets you to, you know, to, to me and a year and a half later, right? Where we're, we're able to kind of invest into more exciting things. But right now it's about these practical things about paying the bills and putting food on the table for me. No, absolutely. That's so important, uh, not just personal, but companies too. Owen, you manage a portfolio of companies that uh, are a part of uh, the, uh, you know, your investments. What advice are you giving the, uh, the startup company CEOs that they follow in the next uh, half of this year? Yeah, well, I think Annie and Scott basically summed it up. I mean, if, if you were doing a round this year, then you know, uh, if you've got any interest, close it. Um, otherwise, try and keep the cash. Um, try and you know, make sure. I mean, and the other. But aside from those things, I think the other important things are, you know, the companies that are, are doing well are the companies that have adopted with whatever difficulty, because we all um, either have to travel or we work in labs. You know, for for us, it's it's not been so bad in terms of actual work, although it's not much fun, uh, as much fun as normal. Sorry, Annie. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, for, for people doing hardware and things like that, it's those that have been able to adapt to do at least something. Um, and it's about how we can keep the teams engaged, how we keep everybody supported and, and positive during this, right? Because we're not Silicon Valley, we're European, we like to be miserable. Um, so we have a bit of an <laughs> battle in terms of making sure that we're all good. Um, so the doom and gloom aspect has been, I think, the hardest thing. Um, but I think most companies have, uh, you know, in fact, all the companies in our portfolio have taken this, you know, have had to take this really seriously. Um, and it's about really trying to get everybody uh, doing as much as they can to survive um, and stay sane. Um, and hopefully in the process, have a little bit of fun. It's brought the teams closer together, I think. Um, it's meant that 
you know, we've had to, we've had a little bit of a common enemy, which has also brought everybody a bit, I think, closer together. Um, it's also nice. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's cash conserv conservation and uh, um, prioritization, right? It's it, that the key things, and stay yeah. positive for us Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> this started, I noticed. Uh, uh, I I have a cricket team here in the Bay Area, and um, I, and I told the teammates, uh, why don't we set up a thing where I teach a class on uh, what I call quadrant two, which is your important but not urgent stuff now that we have little yeah. time of kind of driving around and you know the, or on an airplane and that turned out to be very useful some of the people were able to take and do the things that they've been thinking about for a long time so there's some those opportunities so let's switch from a more micro level to a much more personal level for individuals listening to this um, forum um, learn and uh, you know see some of the clues that you have each of you left behind um, I wanted to ask you, my first question is, what are some habits that you formed? Uh, what are some uh, decisions you made in your career that brought you to where you are um, uh, today, uh, uh, you know, uh, early on in your career? What kind of um, fork in the road that you encountered? What decisions did you make and what habits stuck along the path that you think uh, are driving you to be able to succeed in uh, in your current role um start we start with you sure um so uh, let's see it's i feel like the old person talking about this but you know really early on in my career the the best advice that i got was from my mentor who said find a great boss to work for because inherently you don't know you you don't know what uh, what is a good employee not a good employee what makes you successful versus not but invariably, if you find a great boss who takes an active interest in um, bringing you along, educating you, giving you exposure, um, then you know you're really in a fantastic place where you can learn and grow, right? And as you, uh, I would say, maturate a bit more, then you know there are other traits that I think that are important to be, and and I found you know tremendous uh, reward uh, for being loyal. Uh, but also for being candid and, and willing to to speak up, and those are really important. Um, and then, as as I started starting, uh, I started companies and failed, and and in many of them, my father gave me a great advice, which is basically be to be very introspective and to give yourself a regular cadence where you're reporting out to others, because uh, starting a company is very lonely. Uh, sometimes, even though you have folks that are around you working with you as a team. Uh, as a CEO, sometimes you don't, you, 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 you're not able to share the anxieties and, the, you know, the three o'clock in the morning, waking up, thinking about cash flow issues. And so if you were to able to give yourself a little space on a regular basis and to write down, you know, literally in a, in a report to your board or your investors and others to share what's happening, uh, that reduces the overall anxiety level and allows you to go a lot further because it is a marathon. It's, it's not a sprint, right? Um, and, and, and then, you know, uh, and, and then now in my career, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I you know, I tell people is, is really to question the norm because we grew up within the, you know, the, the, the display industry has so much legacy and history and, and amazing success. And people have followed certain tracks or habits of how they're successful. And my advice is to say, respect that, learn from that, but create your own route because basically there's, um, that's how really value is created. It's not by following somebody else. It's by questioning what's happening and thinking to yourself, is there a way to do it better? And and am I and my team in position to go create that and chart that course? So that's my thought. Any what decisions did you make in your career that got you here? Oh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> somewhat a, a weird a weird one. I. Um, about 10 years ago when I, uh, sorry, 15 years ago, I, I, um, I, I was a software analyst. I, I was doing uh, supply chain optimization. You know, how many shirts in a, how many shirts of each color goes in a box to fulfill like a, a supply chain need? And I, I got fired um, because I was too arrogant as an as analyst. I, I, I asked for a raise every single month and I got one for like six months and then my boss said no more. And so I decided, you know what, that was so materialistic. I need to go back and hang out with my mom and dad. And so 15 years ago, I moved back to Taiwan. And the only job in Taiwan 
was with the team in the, in the display industry and that's how i happened upon this and so this i would say you know that that was the fork in the road to decide to go back to taiwan and work with my father yeah oh, very nice yeah we usually we, we see a lot more people from asia going to north america or europe and you actually did the reverse uh, and yeah yeah it's 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 uh it's it's been very very interesting but you know seeing it from asia and then also having that understanding from 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 america and europe because i work for SES is uh it's been tremendous and eye-opening for me yeah. so any how does a lawyer get into uh, a coo role <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question um there was a moment when i was a lawyer i was a young lawyer uh and I, a partner asked me if I would help him with a very thankless task that no one else wanted to do. And it was something like building for the future, no credit, no, you know, just extra work and no, no positives really coming out of it. And I said yes to that. And uh, I can trace back to that moment, all of these other things that happened along my career path that ended up at Avagant. Um, it introduced me to people. It got me in front of people who later, when I had my own law firm, um, I reached out to them as potential clients and then they brought me in. And so there's they, there are all these things that can happen that you don't even expect. Um, so for me, helping was mm -hmm. a very critical thing early on, like not, not being in it for the glory necessarily, but rolling up your sleeves and, and, and helping someone who needs help and it can come back to you in surprising ways. Um, and then also, uh, I, I discovered uh, that I enjoy risk. Like as a lawyer, you're always mitigating risk <laughs> and trying to like identify and then tamp down that risk and, and help people avoid risk. But as I progressed in my career, I realized I actually enjoy a certain amount of risk. I like to understand it and do some planning, but I think that there's a nice balance of planning and I call it improv because I enjoy some improv too. Like you're you're thinking about the right way to go, but you're open to possibilities and maybe something comes up that you don't expect and you go explore that. Um, and I think the most interesting parts of my work adventure have been when I embraced risk and I tried something that I hadn't tried before. When I became COO, um, I went on Google and I Googled, what does a COO do? <laughs> I was pitching this to my CEO and, and turns out he did the same thing. It's like, what does a COO do? And then we talked about it and we discovered that it's really a malleable uh, position that is complementary to the CEO. And so how do we complement each other? How do we have skills that um, are different but help each other and are additive? Um, and so all of these different paths that I took, I think, positioned me for this role that is really a bunch of things together and learning. And I have a team that's very supportive and knew that I was doing things for the first time and gave me the space to do that. So it's been an interesting journey. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, and you know, in our industry, people, uh, you know, from R&D, they, they think the rest of the uh, commercial aspect uh, is not so important. It's all about R and D. And you went from right. core R and D <laughs> to uh, a very commercial role. Uh, what caused you to do that? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I'm probably going to say the same as Scott and Annie, but just in a slightly different way. But I mean, you know, if I, if I trace it back, um, I think there's a few things that I've, I've made. I mean, it's a difficult question. Uh, it took me about three weeks since you first sort of posed this to think about this. So um, it's not an easy one to come up with. But um, I mean. One thing that I've always done is, is try to invest in myself, and and this is about you know continual development, always learning. So the, and this is curious curiosity. Um, yeah, I mean basically not saying no. So if somebody asks you for help, as Annie said, you get stuck in not because you want the glory, but because you want the learning. Um, uh, you want to be uh, the, the experience as well. Um, and I think when you do things like that, the opportunities uh, come come to you almost right. Um, and I think it's about being in the right place at the right time, following your passions. Um, is also important uh, because it's very it's very easy to be motivated about things that you love and you care about. Um, and I have some more, more more kind of you know I think one of the things that struck me early on in my career was 
how often you're in an uncomfortable situation and if you can switch your framing to be comfortable in those uncomfortable situations then life is suddenly a lot easier and actually you can embrace those uncomfortable situations um because of the the, the strength it gives you um and i think that just reframing things like that also helps a little bit with with some of these tough um tough jobs that we we need to do um and for me one of the important things i i'm, I'm a scientist at heart um, i did a lot of work on liquid crystals and their interface is really important. And I think in business, interfaces are always the most important thing. So, you know, identify and manage those interfaces. Um, it's the edges where stuff breaks and where stuff happens. So that, that's where you get the, the things are gonna go wrong and where the things are gonna go right is always at an interface somewhere. Um, and I think for me, just a personal thing, it's a personality thing as much as anything, but, you know, openness and transparency um, and, uh, you know, ability to kind of voice concerns, give feedback and receive feedback, I think, also very critical for self-development and development of your teams around you. Um, and I think what Scott said about, you know, get a good boss is, is great. I mean, that, that helped me a lot. And that just in that moment, I thought, well, and that helps you because then you be a good boss. And that also then helps you to catalyze that. So, you know, what, what you said that habit, uh, that, that success leaves clues. Well, I hope that the success leaves clues in, in, a, in a string of other successful people that are more successful than I am. That, that's the ultimate aim right, of, of being a leader. Um, and, and, and helping your teams. Uh, the, 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 there is, I, I can relate to almost everything that uh, each of you said um, in my career. I went from being an engineer to uh, uh, went into a marketing role going back well over 30 years. At that time, it was very simple. I liked talking to customers way more than sitting at the bench and working on oscilloscopes and signal generators and things like that. And uh, I was also very fortunate to have these bosses and these CEOs I worked for that uh, were uh, helped me at every step of the way. In the last three, four months, I've had the opportunity to call many of them and say thank you for you know helping me 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever it is. Um, it's very, very wonderful to have those opportunities. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask, Annie, we'll start with you. Um, uh, you know, if you were to go back and redo something, looking back at your career, what is that one thing that you would uh, go and uh, change? There was a moment, um, this was when I was, I would say a baby lawyer, my very first lawyer job. And um, I like to joke around and that was a very big part of who I was. I maybe chose poorly in my profession because the legal profession is not my <laughs> profession, but um, I can remember sitting in my boss's office and he said something and I kind of made a joke and he stopped and he said, you need to not joke around. People won't take you seriously. You're not going to get promoted. You're not going to get into court. You're not going to be successful in the legal profession if you joke around. And I always thought people could tell that even though I joke around, I also have a serious side and I'm professional and I'm you know, responsible. Um, but that struck me and I totally changed my personality. The mm. next day I came in and I was Lawyer Annie and I wasn't myself for 10, 15 years. And then I got to a point where I looked back at my career and I was like, okay, I'm successful. As they say, you're supposed to be successful, but I'm not happy. And that's when I started coming back to who I was and maybe it's easier to do later in your career than when you're a baby lawyer or starting out and asking for a raise every month. Um, but I realized that I wasn't being myself and I didn't enjoy coming to work every day as somebody else. And a lot of people have to do that as particularly underrepresented groups, you know, show up as how the majority mm -hmm. group expects you to show up. Um, but I gave in too easy. I think I should have hung on to what is really a core part of who I am. Um, and it should have been a red flag that I was in the wrong place. There were other places I could have gone where I could have been myself and I could have joked around it. And I eventually went into court and was absolutely myself and the judges enjoyed it. Um, so it's it's a tricky thing because if if it's perceived as something you have to do to be successful, then you have to make that calculus yourself. But um, that was a point at which I started solving for joy. I realized I want to enjoy what I do. Um, it's not every day, it's not every moment, but finding 
joy in the work that I do is critical to me being happy. And so I now am my silly and goofy self at work and I'm around a bunch of people who appreciate that and also know that I'm professional and give me a certain modicum of respect, I think. Um, and that balance is really important. I, for the first time in my career, can bring my whole self to work and that feels really good. Well, that's so important, right? We, you know, a lot of times we don't take the time to look back, and uh, you know, that's very important. Owen, what would you have done different? Oh, my answer seems a bit facile now after Annie's, and thank you for sharing that. That was quite profound. But yeah, I, I think I would have just learned more. Yeah, I as, a, as, a, as a poor chemist, I just feel a bit like uh, I'd like to have learned a bit more physics. Uh, I've always tried uh, to better understand, you know, what's going on with the devices. Um, and more and more, I think it's uh, it's just a skill that I, I feel um, I would have. And it's one of those things that I would have liked to have studied a lot, and probably will do at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it's very hard because I, I mean I've made a I've, I've pride myself on having no regrets. There's nothing in my career that I would look back and really change. I, I think I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, ups and downs, uh, or, you know, all of it. It's all been. It all makes you part of who you are. Um, so I don't think I would change anything other than be just a bit better what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott, what would you uh, have done different if you look yeah, back at you? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, how do you say, I'm a non-technical person in a very technical industry. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that um, my value when I walk into a room has always been the ability to explain uh, something very technical in a non-technical way. And that's because I had to understand it myself and that's the only way I understood. <laughs> uh, and, and that said, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, I, I would have done a lot more. <laughs> I would have been more, more serious at school, really, and, and taken to more technical -ish topics and issues. And, 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 and that would really round me out as an individual because I, I, I think I, I would have seen a lot more pitfalls and uh, projects that we, we went into, a lot more fundamentals, look at things from a physics perspective as to you know, what is the law and how do you interpret that in terms of the context that we're in. Um, so, so a lot more fundamentals, I think, I, I would have gotten me to a better place in my opinion. Although I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy where I am, but it's just, uh, it would have been really nice to have, yeah. Uh, it's so true, I think if we don't go back uh, and look back, some of those opportunities to learn will be lost. And uh, now you have the opportunity to look back, even if it's a theoretical thing and you can share. There are many people are uh, in their careers there, that spot where you were many years ago, and this is a learning point body. Um, mm -hmm. So we are coming up on the hour, and uh, this will be my last question. We'll start with you, Scott. Um, if um, you are new entrant into the industry, what area would you advise that they go look uh, for a career in terms of what technology, what types of companies, what kind of disciplines, and as well as give us some of your parting thoughts on uh, in the industry in general. Okay. I mean, if if I was newly coming back in, in into the display industry, I would actually look in, like Owen said a little earlier, the fringe, right? Where is the interface between a meaningful display technology and a meaningful application? And to weave somehow through, to understand the, that's called the limitations and also the values of that technology. And then what is what does that mean, the, the what and so what, right? So uh, what does that mean to the application itself and how do we weave something that's of more value out of it? And, and I think that's where, the, you know, the, the more time that I find, my, you know, I was reflecting on, on where I want to spend my time, that's where I would want to spend my time. It, it, and, and there's some some great, great applications out there. And, and, and you know, the, a, a real quick parting thought on, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I, you know, the last place where I thought I would be 15 years ago was in the display industry. And having kind of spent the last 12 years in reflective displays and trans, transflective these things that I, I didn't even know how to pronounce, I, I would say, you know, I'm tremendously uh, grateful uh, for the diversity and the opportunity that the display industry has opened up. It's, it's you know, if you're in the display, you're, you're newly coming into the display industry, you're really lucky because it's, it's a place that has just so much potential and diversity and amazing people that, that, that you're about to meet. So uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful, so. No, thank you so much. I completely agree with you. This is a wonderful, wonderful industry. Any uh, parting thoughts as well as uh, 
where do you recommend uh, people to uh, uh, young people joining industry go? Light field displays, maybe. <laughs> well, um, I, I didn't even know the display industry existed a few years ago, so it's, it's relatively new for me. Um, I, if if I had known about this, if I was going to do it over again, um, knowing what I know now about where the uh, demand is for talent, um, I would want to be an optical engineer. Um, the problem though is like Owen, I was a chemistry uh, major and I hated physics. I, I did everything I could to avoid physics class. <laughs> So I don't know quite how I get from that to optical engineering, but if I could just like flip a switch and be an optical engineer, that would be fantastic. I would take physics or chemistry any day because chemistry is harder <laughs> for me. <laughs> I do love chemistry, but you can admire a lot of things that even if you're not good at it. Um, Okay, uh, Owen, uh, same question. Uh, where would you advise somebody to go work uh, in our industry? And then uh, any parting um, thoughts about our industry and uh, as well as this uh, yeah. um, forum? So, yeah, I mean, it's a great industry to work in. I mean, it's tough times, but everybody's having tough times. It doesn't change the fact that it's an awesome industry with a lot of, as Scott said, a lot of diversity, both in, in the technology and in the markets. Um, um, so you know I, I think you know this year has been it's been uh, difficult but i think we're going to create a lot of new opportunities and uh, you know i think that the fact that we're all going to be at home for an extended period is probably going to drive demand even more for these new applications um in terms of where i would go um for if i was starting out now i would i would actually i mean i i, I worked in liquid crystals i never worked on displays um i worked in in semi liquid crystal semiconductors um i would I would go back and I would make the holograms that we were trying to make during my postdoc, uh, because now the technology platform is about mature enough to actually go and make that thing with more than one pixel. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think holography is is going to be uh, is going to be big, and um, I think that's going to be the next big thing after after AR and VR once we've solved those problems. Okay, thank you. I had a little bit of connection problem, but. Uh... Well, we did pretty well, I think. Uh, we managed the whole hour with 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 very few uh, <laughs> IT, and so that was good. Uh, so we started the CEO forum just to give uh, something to those who are not just attending the technical conferences and symposiums to give something for people in HR, people in sales and marketing and business development and so on and so forth. And that is the value that uh, this forum brings. And uh, we will all, of course, have Q and A. Where people will be able to participate and speak with each of you. But thank you so much for being part of this and giving your time. And uh, uh, I know we are in different places, and this uh, wonderful technology has brought us together to be able to talk and uh, um, give something back to our industry, so everybody can get back in the second half of the year, make up for some lost time, and go off and create something wonderful. We'll all look back, and if we ask ourselves the same questions next year the uh, and hopefully this is a, a point in which we can say because of all the things we did uh, this year and because of the experiences we had recently we are better and we are going to do much more and we are going to be able to contribute and uh, we'll have a very joyous uh, future so with that thank you so much uh, for your time thanks thank you yeah thank you so much bye bye, -bye.